Okay, boys and girls. For a while now, there's been something that I've been wanting to do, and it's got to do with the AR-15. Now, I've got two of the damn things. Uh, the first one I got came out of the settlement check for my divorce, and it's a Smith & Wesson M&P uh, Optics Ready Carbine, so it's a, it's a little bit old. I've had it for a while now, and when I found out that Brownells was making this thing called the AR-180, I kind of wanted to get one. So that's what I did. So for those of you that don't know, the AR-180 is um, an AR-15 upper developed by Brownells that'll fit on most AR-15 lowers. And instead of the direct gas impingement system, this one runs on a piston. It's based off the, the old stoner design, the AR-18. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take this thing apart. We're going to have a look at it and see all the different parts, see what it came with. We're going to clean it up, get it ready to install on the rifle. So as it comes from Brownells, it comes covered in some sort of grease. And I've had this out of the packaging for a couple of days now. And the grease on the outside has been wearing off. But it's still there. Now personally, I don't consider this grease to be a lubricant. This is more preservative so that the thing can sit on a shelf for however long until someone purchases it. Now with that in mind, what I want to do is I want to take that grease off and replace it with lubricant where necessary and otherwise leave everything else kind of dry. So first thing we're going to do is take this thing apart and to get the the bolt assembly out we need to get this out which is kind of a friction fit in the back of the upper receiver here. So we're going to grab the charging handle, going to rack it, You'll notice the little gap there, rack it until it pops out like that. And you'll see here we've got a double recoil spring and a couple of guides mounted into this plastic insert at the back here. These are not captive, they will come off. They are interchangeable, they are identical. So you're gonna set that aside for now. Once that's out, we track the bolt to the back here, align it with this cutout so you can pull the charging handle. Out comes the bolt. You'll notice that it is not the same thing as an AR-15 bolt carrier. You'll see here the grease that I was talking about earlier. It is kind of a lubricant. You're more than welcome to run yours out of the box as you see fit. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to clean this up, replace it with my own lubricant. So you'll see here, it looks like a pretty standard AR-15 bolt, at least the bolt face, the radial locking legs. This does slide in and out of the bolt carrier. You'll see this little track here that the cam pin sits in. That's how you get your bolt rotation. The back here we've got a cotter pin to retain the firing pin. So we're going to pull that out. And we're going to pull the firing pin out. It looks the same as a regular AR-15 firing pin. I believe they are interchangeable. They should be identical. Once that's out, we can take the cam pin out. And out comes the, the bolt. Now you'll see that the bolt doesn't have the gas rings on here because it's not that kind of gas system. It does have a spring on the back. Standard plunger ejector and looks like a standard extractor. I'm not sure if these parts are interchangeable with AR-15 parts. It would surprise me if they weren't, but that's the bolt in the AR-180. The bolt carrier is just a big old chunk of steel. It's fairly hefty. It's not as heavy as the full carrier system in the AR-15 though. So that's the internal systems in this portion. What we need to do now is remove the handguard so we can get to the gas system. We've got to pull this clip out. To do that, I hear the best thing to use is a punch. And that pops right out. It's quite tight in there. See the grease here. Not the tuning fork effect. That's there simply to retain the handguard to the to the barrel, which is retained to the upper receiver. And this handguard is really tight on here. Pulling it apart isn't going to work, so I need to bash it on something. Muzzle first, and instead of banging it on the table, I'm going to bang it on the floor. Not quite sure that's working. Where's me mallet? This is taking some persuading, but it is moving. Slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. Got a big old chunk of wood here, and I'm just banging on the muzzle while holding on to that. So bear with me for a minute. 
It's coming slowly. Now this is something that a user is supposed to do because we do need to get in here to run maintenance on the piston system occasionally. So I do definitely need to open this up. Now I'm not really banging on the muzzle, I'm banging on this muzzle device. So I'm not changing any of the geometry around the crown here. Any of the critical geometry that determines accuracy. And I'm using soft wood, so it's not doing any damage to the muzzle device itself. I'm going to change this out eventually anyway. Okay, so we got that apart. Out she comes. And all this sawdust is from the mallet. It's a nice chunk of grease in there, look at that. So a lot of particulate matter came out of the mallet, which got pretty well fucked up. But we got the hand got off. This thing's nice and light. It's also very skinny, which is nice. Now underneath the handguard, we have our gas system. So a standard 16 inch barrel to match the carbine length of the AR-15 that we're going to be putting this on. And up here, we've got our little gas piston. So, see this reciprocating mass over here. So what happens is as the bullet travels down the barrel, gas gets bled off from behind the bullet up into this gas block which then feeds into this piston over here. You'll see that the piston has some holes in it to relieve excess pressure. When that burning gas comes through, pushes that back, doesn't travel very far, and that pushes this operating rod into the front end of the bolt carrier here. As the bolt carrier comes back, the bolt itself is gonna stay stationary for a moment. It's gonna rotate because of the cam in here, unlock, and then cycle. And the recoil spring is going to push everything back forwards, cycle repeats. Now to get this apart, we're going to grab the piston here, pull it backwards, pull out the extension, pull out the piston cup, and now comes the operating motor, and it's spring. That's all pretty simple. It's a fairly simple system, it's fairly reliable by all accounts. Most contemporary weapons are moving to this kind of a piston system anyway. It's not that the AR-15 is outdated, it's that it's just, it's just that it's a different system. It still works, still does the job, but I wanted to get a piston. And as I said earlier, what I want to do is I want to get all this uh, factory grease off, because it's more preservative than it is a lubricant. Most importantly, I want to get it out from the barrel from the inside of the barrel and on the primary working parts. I'll then be replacing it with my own lubricants and greases and preservatives. Not that I don't trust the factory to install good stuff, I just like my stuff better. First step in the process is going to be degreasing. And you're welcome to use any degreaser you want. I've got some True Strip from Duracoat back when I painted the AR-15. I'm just going to spray it on. Now this process doesn't have to be perfect, it's not like they put bad stuff on there. I'm just taking it off for the sake of taking it off really. You don't necessarily have to get every microscopic piece of grease off, but I do want to make sure that everything is clean. Look at this. Then I'm going to make sure that everything is greased the way that I want it to be greased and lubricated the way I want it to be lubricated. And I'm going to make sure that the barrel is clean on the inside so that when we do shoot it there's no issues with any of it. Okay, I do believe that it's sufficiently degreased. Next thing I'm going to run is some solvent, just for the sake of it, really. See if anything comes off with that. As far as gun maintenance is concerned, solvents are typically there to help soften carbon fouling, to help remove copper fouling, lead fouling. And you do get some that are more aggressive at attacking those chemicals than others. Nice thing about frog lube is it's not terribly aggressive. But it will do the job. One interesting thing to note is that this upper is chambered in 223 Wild. Now the nice thing about the 223 Wild chambering is that you can do both 556 5, NATO as well as 223 Remington. There's a very minor difference between the two. Um, I believe it's the outside case dimensions, maybe the inside as well. The 223 Wild will accept both 223 Remington and 556 five, NATO. Now this here is the rifle that I'm going to be putting this upper on. Somewhere down the line I'm going to be re rebuilding this upper to have as long a barrel as I possibly can and redoing the lower to make it a rifle as opposed to a carbine. 
But what we're going to do here is we're going to take the upper of this rifle and we're going to see what the internal differences are between the two. I'm going to pop these pins out, separate the two. I'm going to set the lower aside for now. Once we've got the upper removed, grab the charging handle, pull that back. Out comes the bolt carrier, out comes the charging handle. And that's a field strip and a standard AR-15 upper. Here's the bolt carrier for the AR-15. Take this apart. I'm going to remove the cutter pin on this side. Standard cutter pin. Remove the firing pin. Look at that, they are identical. Once the firing pin is removed, push that back. Rotate the cam pin 90 degrees. Extract it. Once the cam pin is out, we can pull the bolt out. You'll see here, we've got our gas rings to provide a gas seal. So the difference in the bolt, lengthwise they're the same. Pretty much the same from the front end. Though the locking lugs on the AR bolt are a little bit thicker. But you'll see on the AR-15 we've got these gas rings. Now part of the gas system on the AR-15, we've got our barrel and a gas block over here. Same thing happens as the bullet travels down the barrel, gas gets siphoned off into the gas block, fed through just a tube, it's just a gas tube, into the receiver. You'll see the gas tube sticking out there. Now all that gas then gets pushed into the gas key on the bolt carrier. That comes down, creates pressure inside here, pushes the bolt carrier back, rotates the bolt, unlocks the bolt, and then everything cycles backwards and forwards. So people are calling this a direct gas impingement system, and they're partially right because the gas does come directly into the working area of the bolt here. But your piston is inside here, inside your bolt carrier. This is the piston system of the AR-15. Once the gas comes in here, it collects behind these gas rings, you have a little chamber in there. Pressure increases, bolt carrier gets pushed to the rear, this unlocks, and then the whole thing cycles. This is an utterly reliable system, it works. Provided you use the correct powders and you don't create unnecessary fouling inside of the gas system. Okay, so there's a few more parts in the the AR-180 over here because of the gap, because of the piston system. Uh, also because the recoil system is a little bit different. We've got the recoil springs over here, which are kept inside of the upper receiver, as opposed to the standard AR-15, where you have a buffer system in the back. Now here's your buffer, and here's your recoil spring. So that's the recoil system in the AR-15. It's all directly linear, which helps manage some recoil. Now the inside of this receiver is looking pretty cruddy at the moment. I greased it and put it in storage because I haven't fired this rifle in a while. And because I knew this rifle was going into storage, I put a ton of grease in here because I didn't want any parts to corrode, didn't want any rust to form. And now it's coming out of storage, we can clean it all out and replace it. Just as a side note, when you got your AR-15 disassembled, you never ever drop the hammer without controlling it forward. Because that will then deform the aluminium on the inside here, which isn't a good thing. Could lead to cracking on the inside, could change the functionality of your bolt hold open device, of your bolt catch, and that's not things that we want to happen. When cleaning your AR-15, lower the hammer under control. Nice thing about switching to the piston system, the recoil springs inside of the receiver, is we don't need this buffer system and recoil system anymore, so we can leave this tube hollow for now. So I'm going to set this aside and we'll carry on playing with these bits. Reassembly of the AR-15 upper. What we're going to do first, put our bolt back into the carrier. Going to make sure that the extractor is on the right side. Align that so we can get the cam pin hole aligned to reinsert the cam pin. Rotate that 90 degrees. Scoot it on forward. Once that's in place, drop the firing pin in. Replace the cotter pin. That's your bolt carrier. Reassemble. Let's get this back into the upper receiver. Going to turn this guy upside down. Take our charging handle. This is just a standard charging handle. Nothing fancy about it. Set that in place. Put the bolt carrier in by aligning the gas key with the trough inside of the handle. Thusly. 
and then slide the whole assembly forward. That's your upper reassemble. We then just put this back on the lower and you're good to go. Now we're going to be focusing on relubricating and reassembling the upper receiver for the 180 over here. So I'm going to set this aside and I'll take care of this. First thing I'm going to do, get some grease on here. And I'm saying grease, nice light coating of grease because it'll stay. And we're not going to be taking the hand guard off again anytime soon. Now, I might collect some dust and dirt and debris from the range. But that's okay, it's on the outside, it's not going to change any of the functionality. And we want some sort of preservative on here. So I'm going to grab my frog glue grease, let's get a little bit on the finger, smear it on. We do not need a lot, just enough to say that it's there. And when the barrel gets hot, this is eventually going to cook off, and that's okay. The finish on the barrel will help make sure that it doesn't corrode or rust or any of that nonsense. So we're just putting on enough that you know that it's there. You can see that there's a bit of a layer of grease on there. That's good enough for me. Good enough for the girls I go out with, to borrow a phrase. Gas piston itself, this thing is going to get pretty hot. There's going to be a lot of carbon that builds up on this. Same story, I'm just going to put just enough to know that it's there. Now the system isn't necessarily self-cleaning, but it's relatively low maintenance. Because as the, as the piston cup here reciprocates back and forth on the piston itself, it's going to help regulate the amount of carbon that stays behind. So we will get some carbon falling out of the system here. And we will get some building up, but unless we're running thousands of rounds at a time, it's not going to be enough to actually stop the system from working. For this section of the upper rod over here, this is the part that reciprocates through the hole at the front of the upper receiver here. I will put a little bit extra on the tail end of the operating rod, because that's a high friction area. I'm going to start piecing this thing back together. This part came off last, so it's going to go on first. Now that will reach without the connecting piece. But it's not going to be enough to actuate the bolt carrier properly. So we do need the connecting piece in there. Make sure we get that back far enough. Get on there, you bastard. There we go. Son of a bitch. Okay, gas system is now reassembled. I managed to get some of the grease off, so I'm going to reapply. Now, there have been some reports of the barrels coming loose after sessions of firing. I'm going to keep an eye on that. If it does become an issue, I'm going to figure out a resolution to that problem. Hopefully though it doesn't. Okay, now we've got to reassemble the bolt and bolt carrier. It's been nicely degreased, which is kind of what we wanted. I'm going to take the small end of this brush here, wrap it in the rag. I'm going to dig around inside of the bolt carrier here. Make sure we get the grease that we want gone out of the inside of this thing. And look at that, it's pretty dirty inside of there. And that takes care of the inside. For the working parts, I'm not going to use this thick tacky grease. I'm going to use the ALG Go Juice because I think it works a little bit better. I don't know if it really does or not, but this is what I'm going to use. And you'll see some of the finish is wearing off already. I'm not sure if this has been test fired at the factory or not. Just from the little bit of racking that I've done with it, it shows where the friction areas are. So we're going to make sure to apply grease to wherever the finish is wearing off because that's where the friction is happening. And anywhere else that friction is going to happen. And the tail end for the spring around here just to keep it lubricated. We're going to leave that, and I want to get onto the locking lugs as well. Put a gold on there and spread it around with the fingers, because this is going to be a high friction area. Set that aside, make sure we've got some grease on the spring here, primarily as a preservative, a little bit of lubricant. Put that back in, and get a little grease on the finger here. Try and get it on the inside of this bolt carrier. Just a little dab. That should be sufficient. So that guy's going back in. Again, extract it to the right side, as if you were looking at the back. Feels pretty slick. See, that's also showing some wear already. Finish is coming off in certain spots. Then we'll get some grease in that, spread it around, and install it. Whatever grease is on the fingers, we're going to put on the firing pin. We don't want this to be soaking wet, just lubricated enough. And whatever's on your fingers is more than enough. So we know this is now lubricated. Throw that back in. Now the cotter pin, I'm not seeing any anything to suggest. Well, this side is a little bit recessed over here. But as it came from the factory, the cotter pin rested in that orientation. But because this recess is on this side, I'm going to put it in, in that orientation. It's not going to change the functionality of the piece. It's not going to change the way the bolt works. It's just going to keep the firing pin from coming out. Lubrication on the outside of the bolt. Get some grease on here. Remember, if it slides, grease it. If it rotates, oil it. I'm going to be using primarily grease on the bolt carrier because everything slides in relation to itself or slides in relation to other parts, and it's now sufficiently greased. And the guide rods here, just whatever's on my fingers, that should be okay, should be sufficient. Same for the recoil springs. Now the next trick is to get the handguard back on. 
And it's a really tight fit, so this is going to take a minute. But I am going to get the grease. That's there's grease inside here, and I'm going to get this grease out. The mating surfaces inside of here have now been degreased. I'm going to use some of the sticky frog loop stuff to replace that. Just a little bit on the inside, so we don't want it to get stuck. Now this is an aluminium handguard going onto a steel barrel. We don't want the two metals to react to each other and combine and become impossible to take apart. Which isn't going to happen anytime soon. It takes a long ass time to do that. But we're just going to create a barrier between the two made out of grease. So as the aluminium oxidizes over time, it's not going to affect the steel of the barrel. Okay, now I need to get knock this thing back on. And again, it's a super tight fit. This is going to take some doing. Okay, that went on a lot easier than it came off. Now that that's snugged back up to the receiver, I'm going to take our U-clip, going to grease it up a little. We're going to pop it back in. Make sure that it's seated. I'm going to get inside of here to remove greasy nonsense. Now we're going to replace that greasy nonsense with our own greasy nonsense. It's going to put some on the inside, spread it around. I'm going to put a little more grease on the guide rods here. Just because I want to make sure that this is effectively lubricated. Teeny tiny amounts. The springs back on. Okay, so as it stands now, we've degreased everything. We've taken the factory grease off and we've replaced it with actual lubricants, preservatives where necessary. What we need to do now is clean the inside of the barrel. And to do that, we have more of these cleaning pellets. So we're going to grab our appropriately sized cleaning rod with the spinny handle. Now one thing I didn't show last time was the difference between a standard cleaning pellet and an intensive cleaning pellet. So this is going to be a standard, it's just straight up cotton. This is going to be your intensive clean. Notice that it's slightly different color and inside there I don't know if you'll be able to pick it up on camera, but there's going to be bits of bronze brush inside of the cotton itself. And that bronze brush is going to help scrub out the ball a little more effectively. So we'll take one of the intensive pellets, install it on the jag. I'm going to take some solvent, saturate that cleaning pellet, and then we're going to run it through the ball. There's three pass-throughs and a whole bunch of crap came out. Look at the color difference. I'm going to let the solvent sit for a minute. Let it work its magic on the inside of that barrel. While we're waiting for that though, I'm going to take this EOTech off of the old upper and put it onto the new one. So we've got our biggest, fattest screwdriver tip here. Fits nicely inside of the EOTech bolt. I'm going to crank this sucker off. Once it's loose enough, you can extract by hand. Here's the EOTech. This is one of the older ones before we had the option to return them and upgrade. I didn't bother because this one's working just fine. Now we need to figure out where we're going to place it. Around about there seems fine to me. Tighten that down by hand. Click. Okay. Tight enough for me. It's not necessarily to any specific torque specifications. And that's going to be good enough. So EOTech now installed on the new one. I am going to have to re-zero the EOTech because it's now on a different rifle. A different position different relation to the barrel. I think that's going to be pretty cool. Okay, the solvent's been sitting in there for a couple minutes. I'm going to take another one of these intensive pellets, put it on the jag, and I'm going to put some more solvent on it. It's a little puddle from when we saturated the first one. It's clean, don't judge. And I'm going to do it again. Okay, that one got kind of messed up and pulling it back through. It does happen sometimes. Trouble with these cleaning pellets in the 22 caliber, is they're really thin, so they do tend to get messed up quite easily. And we'll run it through again. I'm going to keep doing this until the pellets come out clean. That's a far cry better than what it was the first time we ran a pellet through. Okay, while the solvent is sitting in there, I'm going to make a quick side note about breaking in of a barrel. So as a barrel comes from the factory, there's going to be a, a number of machining processes done to it to get the rifling inside of it and to get the chamber cut inside of it. Now, the process of cutting the rifling into a barrel if it's not hammer forged. They're going to take a very hard and steel button and they're going to force that down the inside diameter of the barrel. What that does is that cuts the rifling as it passes through the barrel. Now when they come in and they put the chamber into the barrel, they're going to take a reamer and they're going to put it in the tail end of the barrel and it's going to spin and it's going to ream out that chamber. So you've got two different processes there. You've got the linear process of cutting the rifling and then the rotational process of cutting the chamber itself. Now between those two, you're going to get a difference in, I guess, texture between the, the chamber and the rifling. Ultimately, you want that to be as uniform as possible, as smooth as possible. The very expensive barrels, you're going to, that process is going to be kind of done for you. So you get that perfect concentricity between the chamber and the barrel and everything's going to be dimensionally the way it's supposed to be from the factory. So on the expensive barrels, you don't really need to worry about that. 
on the cheaper barrels, you might. Um, there's not a lot that you can do other than taking some polishing compound and putting it on some sort of reamer or something and putting it in the chamber and spinning it. That's taking away metal from the inside of the barrel and that's not necessarily a good thing unless you're chasing those really tiny groups and that's a process that you think is actually going to help. Now on the inside diameter of the barrel itself, on the lands and grooves of the rifling, as it comes from the factory those corners are going to be very sharp and there may be some sort of tool marks left over from the cutting process which you kind of want to make go away because that could maybe potentially lead to some sort of inconsistency and accuracy. Now you're going to achieve a lot of that by running cleaning patches, bronze brushes through your barrel. You're going to take a lot of whatever is, whatever's in there and what's not supposed to be there out. Any sort of like um, little bits of steel that are just kind of sitting there are going to be pushed out by general cleaning. Now you'll get some guys who will do a break-in process and what they'll do is they'll run, they'll shoot one round and they'll clean the fuck out of the barrel and then they'll shoot another round and clean the fuck out of the barrel and they'll do like 10 repetitions of that and then they'll shoot five rounds and then clean the fuck out of the barrel and then another five rounds and clean the fuck out of the barrel. They're going to work up from one round between cleanings to five rounds between cleanings to 10 rounds to 15 rounds however many they feel is necessary as part of the process. I don't think that's absolutely necessary. You clean the barrel when you get it, you run some bronze brushes through it, you run your cleaning patches, you run your solvents, you get the inside of that barrel clean and then you take it out and you go shoot it. What I think is that you your barrel is never going to be more accurate than that first shot. Because every time you put a shot through your barrel, it's going to wear ever so slightly. Every time you take another shot, the accuracy of your barrel is going to degrade ever so slightly. So why would you then accelerate that process by shooting one round and then cleaning the fuck out of it 10 times in a row? And then shooting five rounds and cleaning the fuck out of it 10 times in a row? I don't personally believe that that's going to make any difference in accuracy. Some people swear by it. I'm in the camp that I think it's a load of bullshit. That being said, let's clean this barrel a little more. The nice thing about these pellets is as they sit on the jag, they're not directional. They're a nice tight fit inside of the barrel, but you can reverse it somewhere in the middle of the barrel. So you can actually scrub the inside. You're not going to do any damage to the barrel by doing that. I'm going to call it at this point. I'm going to say that it's clean enough. It's going to be perfectly functional. It's going to be perfectly accurate as it can be. I'm done cleaning this thing at this point. So I'm just going to reassemble it and we're going to attach this thing to the lower and see how that works. Reassembly, I'm going to slide the bolt carrier in. You'll see that the charging handle is keyed to keep it aligned. I'm going to drop that in. Make sure there's no interference between the optic and the charging handle. We're goal. Put the recoil system back in and seat that forward. One thing I have noticed with this particular wrapper is that the this little pin in here is sticking out a little bit far so that the dust cover doesn't snap closed like it should. To remedy that, I kind of want to pull that pin out and figure out a way to machine that down a little. I wonder if this is going to be thick enough or thin enough to get in there. It should be. There we go. That's working coming out but it's slow. Okay so this here is a teeny tiny roll pin. I'm going to set that aside for now. Try and extract the pin punch. Dust cover being plastic isn't helpful because it's kind of tight and I hope I'm not deforming that plastic any. I'm going to pull this pin out. Fingers aren't working. Okay here's our pin and that is super fucking tiny. Now the spring is still in there. I'm going to leave that as is. Take the grease off. You can see that's a really tiny pin. But this little extension right in here is a little bit too long. I need to figure out how to make that a little bit shorter. Okay, so this here is my milling machine. It's a little bench top one. And you'll see that little tip right down there. That's that pin. So I got it chucked up into the milling machine. I'm gonna set that spinning and I'm gonna use a very tiny needle file to change the geometry of the end of that pin. I'm gonna switch to a bigger file just to get the meat that I wanna get off of there. I'm just making it a little bit shorter, making the end flat for now. Now that the end's flat, I'm going to work on rounding that edge with the needle file. It's kind of weird doing this with the camera so close. Okay, we're getting a little short here, so I'm going to try and bring this out a little bit. Actually, that should be pretty sufficient. We'll try it in the rifle and see how it works. Okay, so here we are back at the rifle. We got our modified part here. You'll see that the finish on this end is nice and black. The part that we worked on, bright and shiny. That should be sufficient. At least in theory. I'm going to put that back in here. Then I'm going to take it out and grease it up. Reinstall the part. It's sitting in there nicely. Get our roll pin started. Tap that sucker back in. Okay, it's being a little difficult, so I'm going to use my pin punch. Get that sitting nice and flush. 
snaps closed this time. Look at that. That works much better. Guys, don't be afraid to modify some parts. Make sure things work the way you want them to. Get in there and make the changes that you need to make happen. Okay, that's all taken care of. What I want to do now is mount this to the low receiver. According to Brownells, this should work on any standard AR-15 low receiver. This one is a Smith & Wesson. Mill spec, so it should, in theory, work. Front pin first. That works just fine. That thing out the way. Yeah. So, it's not sitting all the way flush, and it's because I've got the stupid ass mag lock in here. Local legislation requires that I have this piece of shit on here. Now this thing is sitting in the way of getting the upper receiver to sit flush with the lower. So we need to make a modification to this part. Pull the receivers apart again. The only thing that I need to do to this is just to create a little shelf and a bevel on the top edge here. Give the upper receiver space to sit in it. Now to figure out how far that shelf needs to be, it's going to take an X-Acto knife here and run a little scratch onto the top of this mag lock. That scratch right there is how far it needs to come. I have a feeling the best way to do that will be on the milling machine. Let's find an appropriately sized bit. That ain't it. There we go. Let's take that part out. Okay, so here's what this part looks like. I need to figure out a way to get this into the milling machine to make that cut. Okay, so here we are at the mill again. I'm going to put this part into the vise. Make sure that the well, this extension over here sits flush the top of the vise. Give it a nice pressure down while I tighten that vise. Make sure it's nice and tight so that the workpiece doesn't slip. And since this piece is aluminium, I'm going to use a high-speed steel full flute end mill to make that cut. And I use collets. Okay, so this machine is just a little bench top mill. It's not exactly a bridge port, but it does the job for small parts like this. It's got to get in position here, make sure I set up the cut properly. Double check all my axes, make sure that everything's lined up the way it's supposed to be. The way that it needs to be for this particular. Now we're going to run this machine at a decent amount of rippings. And we're going to do a series of very light cuts because this, this machine being so small has, some, has a lot of flex in it. And that's the cut pretty much made. So I'm just going to do a couple finishing passes without making any adjustments, just to make sure that everything's cut nice and square and the finish is looking good. I believe these are called spring cuts. So whatever flex is in the machine is now being taken out by all those extra cuts and we're getting exactly what we need. And it looks like we're done. Let's get all these little chips out the way. Now you'll see there's a bit of flash left over. Finger usually takes care of the bulk of it. Let's make sure there's no sharp edges. I'll just use my X-Acto knife again to get that sharp edge off. And it's pretty spiffy. I'm just going to round off the edges with a little needle file here. Get those sharp corners out of here. Just to make it a little more acceptable for human hands. Round off those sharp corners. Fight out the vise and you'll see we've got a nice shoulder cut into there now. Hopefully that should be enough to allow the receivers to make. Yet still retain the functionality of the mag lock so that we're probably legal. It's not the straightest cut in the world, but it should do. Okay, back to the rifle here. Let's get this part back in and reassembled. We'll see how well we did with that cut. I'm just reassembling this magazine catch here. And let's check final dimensions. See if that cut that we made was sufficient. Ah, look at that. It was not. Trial and error, boys and girls. I gotta figure this out. Back apart she comes. Back from the mill again. All I did was make the shoulder a little bit wider this way. So let's try it again, see if that works. Okay, so we've got the shoulder where it needs to be, but the overall length of that piece needs to come down a bit. It's blocking ever so slightly. So what we need to do now is we need to move this edge a little further inwards, just so that it's functional with the top receiver. Here we go again. Okay, back from the mill and we've taken this edge down a little bit. Let's see what that does. Let's try it back together again. Hey, look at that. Upper receiver fits flush with the bottom receiver. Functionality of the mag, mag lock is retained. Pull the rear pin, separates, and then you can push. So that works. That's not going to get in the way of ejecting brass. Look at that. Well, it's all together now. It's going to take a oily rag, run it over the exterior, all the metal parts. And we are golden, boys and girls. Good to go. Fan-fucking-tastic.